Roosevelt will be inaugurated March 4th, 1933. And at his inaugural address, or at his inaugural ceremony, he will give one of his most famous lines. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And when he said this, people believed him because he genuinely meant it. And that came across. Hoover said very similar things, but people just did not believe him because he didn't internalize it as much. Roosevelt's confidence and optimism uh, was one of the most important things he will bring to the country. And it will, his inaugural address will start what is called the first hundred days. Every president since the, this time has been judged on their first hundred days and it's never a fair comparison because what FDR came into was the United States on the brink of collapse. And that is not an exaggeration. During the first 100 days, he will get 15 major pieces of legislation passed. And there is, it's very unlikely that will ever be uh, matched because when I say the whole system collapsed, I mean the entire banking system collapsed. And by collapsed, I mean between his, inaugur or his election in November and his inauguration in March, the banking system of the United States had effectively shut down. It was completely shut down in 32 states, including New York and Texas. When banks are shut down, it means capitalism has stopped working. Uh, you cannot have a capitalist system without a banking system. Fun fact also, that is why he is the last president that is inaugurated March 4th. According to the Constitution, presidents are inaugurated March 4th, but that big period between November, the election, and the inauguration, it's called the lame duck period. Uh, that was left that long, or that was left uh, that big because when the Constitution was written, it took a long time to get anywhere because horse and buggy. Well, during that period, that's when the banking system collapsed. And that meant the whole system was going belly up. And that is not an exaggeration. The reason the Great Depression is the Great Depression is because the banking system collapsed. It's also why in 2007, 2008, uh, banks were bailed out because I can criticize banks as well as anyone else. Economic collapses, they almost always have banks doing dumb things behind them, but you need to have a banking system. So once he got into office, the very first thing Roosevelt had to do was stabilize the banking system. The whole thing was belly up. And I promise you this, if you wanted to, he could have nationalized the banking system. He could have socialized that part of the US economy. There were people around him that wanted him to. There were economists that said it should be nationalized. If we nationalize it, we can stop all these economic collapses. There were other countries in the world that will nationalize their banking systems. Roosevelt never once considered it. Had he been a socialist, this is what he would have nationalized because he could have, and I guarantee you he could have, uh, and also there were just a lot of people that wanted him to, but he never once considered it. And he wanted to make sure the banking system stayed uh, part of the capitalist system, part of the uh, private enterprise system, so it was privately owned. But the very first thing he had to do is stabilize it. So when he got into office, he called a bank holiday. It was inaugurated on March 4th, uh, the very next day, March 5th, Sunday, March 5th, he will call for a bank holiday that's going to last one week. So from March 6th to the March, March 13th, Monday to Monday, where banks would be just shut down. So he shut down all banks throughout the country. Now, did he have the power to do this? Probably not, but no one was going to stop him. Even really conservative Republicans acknowledged the whole system was collapsing. So... He will get a lot of 
praise from everyone, from all parts of the country, from people that will, from bankers, from conservative Republicans, from all over, people all over, for how he handles this. Because he took a system that was belly up and he will stabilize it. He called Congress into special session, and when they got there, he had the Emergency Banking Act waiting for them. So Congress convened, and he said, sign the Emergency Banking Act. Now, normally when a law goes through Congress, every person in Congress, every person in the House of Representatives, every person in the Senate gets a copy of the bill. They debate it for months, and sometimes it takes forever for a bill to actually pass. When Congress got into session, there was one copy of the Emergency Banking Act on the center of the floor, and they were told, pass this now so we can save the banking system. No one even read it, but the vast majority of people in Congress, including Republicans, signed it because everyone knew this is an emergency. What the Emergency Banking Act did was send uh, federal employees that were with the Treasury Department and the Fed out to go investigate all the banks in the country. They started with the biggest banks and then they looked at the smaller banks and they figured out which ones could be saved. The ones that could be saved were given a loan from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the uh, thing that was created by Her Herbert Hoover. The ones that could not be saved were liquidated and absorbed into the bigger banks. So all the banks were either stabilized or incorporated into the bigger banks. Now, in order for this to work though, people have to have faith in the banking system. They have to be willing to put their money back into banks. And this is also where FDR's real genius came in as a president. And this is one thing that anyone who lived through the Great Depression, uh, they talk about his fireside chats because he was a master of the radio. And when he gave these fireside chats, he'd give them once a week to talk directly to the American people. They describe it as feeling like he was in the room with them, talking directly to them. And he gave the very first one the night before banks opened. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. And this worked. The next day, people were lining up to deposit their money into the banks. When they were interviewed, they were asked, why are you putting money, your money back in the banks? They said, because the president told me I had to, because it is my responsibility. During the New Deal, Americans will become more collectivistic. Remember the 1920s or hyper-individualism, every man for themselves? 1930s, during the Great Depression, Americans will become more collectivistic. They felt like they had a responsibility to their nation. And so in the first day alone, more than a billion dollars is deposited. And they did it because they said, the president told me I needed to. Within two weeks, more than half of all the money that had been taken out was deposited back in. So the banking system, it was stabilized and it will save the banking system. Now, this was an emergency measure. It stopped the banking system from declining and it got people to reinvest, but there has to be long-term reforms. So in order to get that, the Banking Act of 1933 will create uh, some regulations that will give long-term stability to the banking system. One provision of the Banking Act is called the Glass-Steagall Act. Now, Glass, the uh, Banking Act, Glass-Steagall Act, actually the same, but Banking Act, super complicated, has a lot of parts. Glass-Steagall is usually refers to one provision within it. And that provision said that investment and consumer banks would be separate. So investment banks, these are big banks that invest in um, more speculative, speculative lending. 
So lending for businesses or like lending for the stock market, uh, lending for things that you might win more, but you might lose a lot more. And they separated that from consumer uh, banks. Remember, consumer banks, that is like what we put our money into for savings accounts, checking accounts. Those, they usually give loans for more stable things, houses, cars, stuff like that. So this separated investment and consumer banking. And so what is it? Uh, what it essentially is doing is making it so people's deposits are safer and also there was going to be limited amounts of speculation. So it made it so there were, banks could not engage in as much speculation and risk depositors' money. And Glass-Steagall will perform incredibly well at stabilizing the U.S. banking system for a long time. Another really important part of it is the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. This is bank insurance. So uh, most people don't go to banks, but next time you are just anywhere near a bank, somewhere on the outside of it, there will be a sticker that says FDIC. This is insurance, just like car insurance, just like home insurance. Every bank that's a member of the FDIC pays into, pays into an insurance pool. And that pool then insures a bank if it collapses. It insures the depositor's money. So when it was passed, it was $500. And today it is $250,000. So you have $250,000 in a bank that is insured by the FDIC, which all major banks are. Then if that bank collapses, you are guaranteed $250,000. Now, if you have $500,000, you are going to lose $250,000. So, the FDIC is deposit, uh, deposit insurance. It is to make Americans feel more secure about their deposits. And it's worked so phenomenally well that most people don't even know what the FDIC is. Uh, most people have not woken up and wondered, are my, is my deposit in a bank safe? It is, everyone just assumes it is safe. And that is because of this. Now, this will, create an uh, unprecedented amount of stability in the banking system. Before 1933, banks failed on average, more than 600 banks failed a year in the United States. That was normal all throughout US history. After 1933, uh, if you study banking history itself, it is a period of unprecedented stability from 1933 to about 1980. That is the period of unprecedented stability in the U.S. banking system. There are not collapses happening all the time, and the system just stabilizes. It is an unprecedented amount of security. After 1980, we will start undoing it. The Glass-Steagall provision will be repealed in 1999. Um, side note, you don't have to know this, but... Uh, when you talk about who's responsible for the 2007-2008 financial collapse, one of the people that are always listed in the top 10, and you can't, can't blame any one person, but one person that is responsible is named Phil Graham. He was a congressman from Texas. His nickname is Foreclosure Phil. Uh, but he will especially be behind deregulating the banking system and financial system. Uh, not surprisingly, he got a lot of money from them for doing that. But the Banking Act, this is not imposing horrible regulations on banks. Banks were able to still do really, really well. It just imposed enough that it was able to stabilize the banking system, which stabilized the capitalist system itself. So after the banking system was, uh, after the banking system was regulated for the long term, Something had to be done about all the homes being foreclosed on. 1933, home, 1932, 1933, homes are being foreclosed on about 1,000 a day. Banks don't want homes. They want the money. And so this is actually hurting banks. So in order to help banks and also to help home, homeowners, government passed the home, Homeowners Loan Act, which created the Homeowners Loan Corporation. That should be HOLC, not HOLA. Homeowners Loan Corporation is a federal agency 
that provided, uh, that offered homeowners the ability to refinance their homes. So people that had a home loan and they had to pay like $500 a month or for 20 years, they were able to refinance through the HOLC. So the federal government under the HOLC is now buying that home mortgage from the banks and refinancing it to make it lower payments, lower in their interest, but it is not giving homeowners anything. It is just allowing them to refinance. So that is all it's doing. And HOLC, it is a, an unmitigated success story of the New Deal. Because from the time it was created, from 1933 to 1946, uh, when it closed, it will refinance about 25% of all homes in the United States. And what's really amazing about it is when it closed, it didn't actually lose money. Because during that time, it was able to refinance home and people were able to pay back the loans, especially when the economy started booming again during World War II. So the HOLC, it is uh, an unmitigated success. It helped save banks and also it helped save home owners. And again, it is not giving anyone anything, just the ability to refinance. So it is an absolute success story of the New Deal. Something also had to be done about the stock market. The stock market crash didn't cause the Great Depression, but it was the spark that ignited it. And so the first regulation of the stock, federal regulation of the stock market is passed in 1933 the Securities Act. Now, this is a very, very complicated and it involves a primary stock market. Or, yeah, I'm not gonna get into the details of the whole thing, but essentially what the Security Act does is it said any company that's selling stocks on the stock market has to disclose relevant financial information to anyone that might be investing. That's it. So if you're going to sell in the stock market, companies have to tell the important data about how their companies are doing to anyone that might want to invest or anyone that might want to buy stocks. The other regulation of the stock market is the Security Exchange Act. And this created a new federal regulatory agency, Security Exchange Commission. This is essentially the police of the stock market. They regulate the buying and selling of stocks, and it is a permanent regulatory body. So before this, the stock market was completely unregulated. And when these things were passing, uh, Securities Act businesses said, well, we're going to go out of business. There's no way we could possibly sell on the stock market if we have to be honest about how our companies are doing. Um, and like before this, they, companies didn't have to tell anything. You know, they'd say like, here's how many employees we have. And you'd have no idea how a company was doing those buying stocks. Uh, they called these things socialism. And of course they passed and companies did just fine. Anytime any regulation is passed on a company that's demanding they provide accurate information about themselves, they always say, well, we're gonna go out of business. The same thing happened when the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, saying companies had to say what their ingredients were. Uh, it happens literally every time, and it has never once been true, ever. So collectively, what these things did was stabilize the U.S. banking and financial sectors and created the longest, most stable period in U.S. banking and financial history. From 1933 to 1980, there will be an for the United States, there's an unprecedented amount of stability. Once we start undoing these regulations in the 19, beginning of the 1980s, we have had so many financial and banking crises. S&P scandal, dot-com boom, 2000, we had one, 2007, 2008. I mean, it has been nonstop. But these things will create a very stable, a very secure banking and financial system. And none of them are 
over taxing companies too much or are over regulations. All banks and financial industry were able to perform incredibly well with these things.